Well, good morning, guys. Who here loves sourdough bread? Anybody just love sourdough? Okay, that's good. So here you go. This is sourdough. That's three for three, people. In case you've been wondering, as a QB, I'm three for three today. So I want credit for that. First service, I went like over the lights, off the walls, and in a woman's lap. But again, three for three. I love sourdough bread. I don't know if you paid attention during that whole COVID season of life, but there was like the first two weeks in March, it felt like people were like, oh, we got a long vacation. And then after those two weeks, they were like, oh, this whole shelter in place thing's continuing, and what am I going to do with all my spare time? And then there was this sourdough phenomenon that was all over social media. Did you see it? Not only social media, but also on my porch. And so like regularly, I would show up and there'd be sourdough, not regularly enough though, just for the record. So if that wants to be you, keep doing that. Problem was I was training for a marathon. So it was kind of bad timing, but I totally cheated every time it showed up. Because if sourdough's on your porch, what do you have to do? Like, you have to eat it. And I loved it. Every time it showed up, I'm a big sourdough fan. You're at third service. If you're hungry, that's not sacred bread. So you're welcome to eat it during church. That's good. But this is like real sourdough. And you can probably... Lexi, you're pregnant, so you can probably smell it, right? Like, you, you're there, it's real. And here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about getting some bread today, but not the kind of bread that you're thinking about. We're going to talk about the only bread that matters. Like, I don't know why it was such a big phenomenon. I don't know if it's because sourdough's filling. I, I don't know if it's because it, it, it's not fast. It takes a lot of work. I don't know if it's because it's comfort food. I don't know the why behind the what. Like, it was in Forbes magazine. It was a big deal. But, but here's what I do know is that bread comes up regularly in the text, it feels like. In the Old Testament, as the Israelites were wandering, God gave manna and, and bread from heaven. Just a couple weeks ago, we were in Jesus feeding the 5,000, taking five loaves of bread and two fish and, and feeding the multitudes. And so today we're going to zoom in on where we've been in chapter 6, that Jesus came to satisfy our deep and eternal hunger for relationship with God. This stems all the way back from the time in Genesis, where God created Adam and Eve for relationship with him. We regularly will use a stool as a metaphor of vintage for the throne of our heart because the reality is this, is that there's vacancy for one. And so God the Father designed you to be in relationship with him. And as a result of sin, we were separated from him. In fact, I believe that that's what hunger pains really are. That we're hungry for that relationship. So when Jesus talks about bread, we got to pay attention to the only bread that matters. He's been building this drama in the Gospel of John. We're going to see the Jews. Now, regularly, John's been calling them the crowd. Today, he pivots for the first time, goes from the crowd to the Jews. And we're going to see that the Jews miss their truest need, and they actually reject Jesus as the solution to their hunger. That their hunger is not just physical. It's legit physical, too, especially at third service. Like, it's a physical hunger, but it's a spiritual hunger to be back in relationship with the Father, because he's the only one that will ever satisfy us. And so here's my hope for us as a church family. My hope is simply this, that we would see and receive him as the living bread of God. Would you pray with me? Father God, we come before you because we want to come as beggars who are hungry. We want to come recognizing, Jesus, that you didn't just come to simply give bread, but to be the bread of life, to feed our souls, to fill our souls, to save our souls. So Jesus, we praise you for laying down your life Forgiving is not just your life, but also your death and your spirit. So, Spirit of God, would you speak to us through the broken bread of life, through the resurrected bread of life? Would you speak for your glory and for our good, we pray, that we might be satisfied in you? And everybody said, amen. Big text today. So we had Michael preach a couple weeks ago, did a great job on feeding of the 5,000. That was chapter 6, verse 1 through 15. Last week, Ryan did a great job of verses 15 to 21 where Jesus is walking on water. He, he pursues the disciples. In the midst of the storm, he shows up. Because where's the safest place to be in the midst of a storm? With Jesus. And so Jesus has been doing these miraculous works, these things that are not normal. Walking on water, it's not normal. Feeding 5,000 with five loaves and two fish, it's not normal. And so this morning we're going to pick up the text and we're going to look at what's the response. So we've got this miraculous work of God. What's the response to the actual miracle? And if I could just not pull any punches, the two sermons this week and next week, they're kind of a bummer sermon to preach. It's not good news. Now we believe in vintage grace that there's no bad news in the kingdom of God, but the response of the people is kind of ugly. They totally miss it. And I don't want us to miss it as a church. In fact, John writes this. He gives us the bad news to warn us, to prepare us so that we might believe. And so this week, we're going to teach a little different than normal. Again, I, I didn't read the whole text like I normally do because there's like 40 verses this week. But here's the big idea. The Jews are going to reject Jesus. 
They're not going to receive him as the bread of life. They're going to totally miss the metaphor that Jesus came to give us food so that we would never hunger or thirst again. And then next week, this is really part two of feeding the 5,000. Because what good is the miracle if it doesn't lead to life change? So Jesus does the miracle to get to the point of the miracle, which was not physical, but eternal hunger. And then next week, we're going to look at the disciples following up on that miracle. How do they respond? Well, again, I'm not trying to, like, I'm telling you the end of the stories. They're lame. And it's easy for you and I to be like, oh, man, the Jews. How many of you guys have ever read the Old Testament or the New Testament and gotten frustrated with the Jews? Anybody? Don't lie. You're in church, right? Like, I get frustrated. Here's the problem with the Jews. They're just like you. They're sinful. They're not faithful. They're broken, they're desperate, dependent, they're hungry, they're just like me, and they're just like we. And so as John tells us this story, let's not miss the why behind the what. The why is that we might respond to his miraculous work differently than they do. So, so here's where we're going. Again, lots of verses to cover. So I hope you're ready. I'm going to talk too fast. It's not going to bother me, okay? <laughs> Chapter 6, starting in verse 1, there's this pivot verse. Michael did a great job. He told us there's like 18 months between our Christmas breaks. We went through chapter 5 in December. We took a break for Christmas. We came back to chapter 6. That word after this just translated as 18 to 24 months later. What has Jesus been doing for the last 18 to 24 months? He's been teaching. He's been doing miracles. John gives us seven signs. We know that there's numerous other ones the other gospel writers record. There's also even more that John says, we don't have time to talk about how awesome Jesus is right now. That's what heaven's going to be like. But after this, he's been teaching, he's been preaching, he's been proclaiming, he's been doing miraculous work. Verse 15 is another pivot verse. Perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. This is John telling us the following of Jesus is getting bigger. The Jews are longing for a Messiah and they think Jesus might be it, that he's going to bring what they want. He's going to satisfy their souls. He's going to bring political revolution. And the Jews are starting to be like, this could be cool. And so the crowds are gathering. They're getting bigger and bigger. And really the sermon this week and next week is all about how you don't grow the church. You call them to be disciples. The church right now might be the biggest it's ever been during Jesus' ministry. People are following, they're listening. And so the point of this sermon is he's going to zero in on, do you really know what I'm saying? Are you really ready to follow me? The next day, the crowd, this is the 5,000 men, even more if we include women and children, the crowd of people that were there at the feeding of the 5,000, they remained on that side of the sea where there had only been one boat there. Jesus didn't enter the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Remember last week, Ryan said they went fishing. They continued on with their life until Jesus said, here's what's next. And so this crowd who just saw the feeding of the 5,000, they were like, this is awesome, but where'd Jesus go? And so they continue on, verse 23, other boats from Tiberias came up near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. And so when the crowd, this large group of people, saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into their boats and they went to Capernaum. Why? They were seeking Jesus. Again, every morning you woke up today hungry. Now that's literal and metaphorical. Like literally, no matter how much you ate, I don't know about you, but for me, even if I had a huge meal, I always wake up hungry the next day. Always. Now, now that's a literal thing. Now please don't miss this because Jesus is going to speak in a metaphor. There are literally people that are waking up hungry. Like as simple as drinking good coffee is, you're making a difference with our Africa partners through 838 Coffee. Thank you. Because there are people that don't have food this morning. And that's something that we believe God has called us as the church to care about and to do something about. But metaphorically speaking, everyone woke up today hungry. Everybody woke up trying to fill their soul and their stomachs with something that would make them happy. Why are they seeking Jesus? Our theme of this whole series is the good life, remember? That again, I never had to convince someone to wake up in the morning and try to be happier tomorrow than they are today. That's how God wired us. In fact, that's what happened in the garden. Adam and Eve said, I'm going to be happier by not trusting you and going my way and knocking God off the throne of his heart. And so in this context, here's what we see. The crowd, they're pursuing Jesus. Why? Because did you see him feed the 5,000? Because that was amazing. Because think about our spirituality. Think about our prayer life. What often do we do? We say, God, here's what I want. Here's what I need. That's an ugly word, by the way, in the American language, need. Because we misinterpret that all the time. But they think Jesus can be, they're just consumers religiously. Jesus can give me what I want, when I want, how I want, my way, right away. Like this is theology of fast food. You, go, you with me? That's what they're after. They're hungry. They're seeking the good life. They're seeking Jesus because they were really impressed a couple of days ago. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? 
Now again, this really isn't a part of the sermon. It's a total sidebar, but I didn't want to miss it because this is very important. Wisdom is not just knowing the right thing, but it's also knowing the right time and the right place and the right tone to say the right thing. So often, I think that people are looking for something and they're asking questions. Jesus is never gonna answer this question, never once. They're saying, Jesus, this is kind of crazy, this is kind of cool, you used to be there, now you're there. Now, is it cool that he walked on water? Absolutely. But they wanna talk about kind of the nuts and bolts and the mechanics, and so they're asking this question, and I want you to notice something, Jesus doesn't answer it. Church, this is really important for us that we need to be led by the Spirit so we know what to say, but also when to say and how to say. They wanted to talk about, again, this directional relationship. They want to talk about the horizontal. How'd you do it? What does Jesus want to talk about? The vertical, the heart. That's what Jesus wants to talk about. And so often our friends will ask us questions and maybe we should show a little more discernment and wisdom on Facebook of what to answer and when to answer and how to answer. And so just don't miss this. The crowd, they're asking this question and they're like, Rabbi, how did you get here? Just like, hey, that's a cool story and all, but we don't have time for that. Let's talk about what matters most. Are you with me? Okay, we'll go back to the sermon now. Verse 26, Jesus answered them, truly, truly. We're gonna see this repeatedly in the text today. That doesn't just mean verily, verily, or amen, amen. Jesus is saying, this is the most true thing that you can know. And how do I know? Because I'm God. See, you're looking for for something horizontally. You're looking for food that will satisfy your stomach. I want to give you food that will satisfy your soul. And so Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, you're seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of loaves. He gets to the heart of the issue. He gets to their motivation. Now, the irony, of course, is they did see a sign. John uses that word specifically to say this miraculous work of God that only God could do, like walking on water or like feeding of the 5,000, ultimately to pull our attention up, not out. When we look out, we get discouraged, we get overwhelmed by circumstances and realities of this day and age. And so Jesus says, look, you're here because you want me to solve your horizontal realities. I'm here to actually get you back to garden living, which is a vertical relationship with the Father. That's what you're actually hungry for. You think you want this, but what I have is way better. And so the crowd cries out and Jesus says, look, you're only here because you ate your fill of the loaves, but I know what you're seeking. Verse 27, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. That which the son of man will give you for on him, God, the father has set his seal. He says this, don't spend your life, your time, your treasure, and your talent working on things that will mold and go away. Like I love sourdough and people have been like, how did you get the bread to stay up there? That was so amazing. It's called glue. It's this amazing invention, right? And I'm really tempted to leave this really for the next seven or eight weeks just to see what will happen. It'll be a church science experiment. But we already know Lexi will no longer sit in the front row anymore, right? Like she's like, I'm out. And here's what Jesus says. Don't give your life to the things that you know are going to go bad. Jesus is offering them food that will never spoil. He says, but you're spending your time, your talent, your treasure on things. That's what you're seeking. You're seeking the good life. I want to introduce you to a new world, a kingdom, where I'm the king, where you get off the throne of your heart, where you're never hungry or thirsty again. And he says, so don't work for that food that perishes. Work for eternal life. But by the way, how do we get eternal life? Well, the son of man gives it. That's it. Like, like that's the only way it arrives is because the Son of Man will give it to you and on him, God the Father has set his seal. So please don't miss this. How do we actually be in relationship with God? We just receive him. That's the only thing he tells us to do here. So he says, he sets the seal. The seal is not something we use a lot, but when they would write letters, they would seal their letter with one of their seals that says, this is the authority, this is the power. And he says, who has the authority or power to save you? The Son of Man gives it to you and on him, that power comes from God the Father. So this drama is building. They're looking for joy. They're looking to be fed spiritually, physically right now. Jesus wants to take them to spiritual. They said this in verse 28. They said to him, so what must we do to be doing the works of God? Have you noticed that we're all a bunch of doers? Like part of, I think, why sourdough blew up, if I could just be really, really honest, it's simply this. Nobody had control in the month of March or April or May or June or July or August. You get the point, right? But when we're out of control, just tell me what to do. And sourdough gave us an assignment that we could measure the right flour. Is there even flour in sourdough? Okay, we could knit, right? Whatever it is, you can tell how good I am at sourdough baking, right? I'm really good at eating. That's what I'm good at. But I think in this day, especially in this COVID season, we're like, give me something I can control because if you just give me the recipe, I won't mess it up. Now, obviously, could I mess up the sourdough recipe? Yeah, absolutely. And so the the, the crowd right now, they're saying, God, just tell us what to do. 
Just tell me what to do because in the, our heart of hearts, we're Pharisees. Just give me the game plan. And here's what Jesus says. I want to just do the works of God. And so Jesus answers them. This is the work of God. Now, don't miss this. We're saved by grace through faith, not of works. But there is an action in our faith we have to receive. We have to believe. I believe you can screw up any sourdough recipe. Jesus is not giving you a recipe. He's helping you see that you can't do it but you must receive it. It's a gift from God that it comes from above. He says this, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. If you've not memorized John 20 verse 31, just do it now. It's gonna keep coming up every sermon. Why? Because John says, I wrote this book so that you might believe and that through believing that you'd have the good life. Everybody woke up this morning hungry. Everybody wanted to be happier today than they were yesterday. And Jesus says, here's the key. The key to your hunger is to just believe in me. Not you, it's not your effort, it's not how good you bake, it's not if you have the right ingredients, you're hosed. When we think about the kingdom of God, that we were dead in our sin, but God makes us alive, he says just believe and believe in him who sent me. John has gone to great efforts to help us as the reader see that Jesus is coming on behalf of the Father. He's talking to Jews, they, they love the Father. They love Yahweh. And so he says in chapter 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, 20. You think there's a big idea here? He says over and over and over again, I want you to see that I'm here because your father sent me. My father sent me. Believe in me. Receive him so that you might have the good life. The text goes on. So they said to him, well, then what sign do you want to do so that we can see and believe in you? Does that bother anybody else? What did Jesus just do in the paragraph before? He walked on water. Now let's give a little bit of grace and mercy. Why? Because the crowd wasn't there. Remember, they don't know how he got there. Okay, cool. I can give grace and mercy. What did he do the paragraph before that? He fed the 5,000 with how many loaves of bread? Okay, church, I have more hope for you. When I ask a question and I tell you the answer, I believe in you. How many fish? Now, the point is, this miraculous work that's supposed to grab the heart and the head, and the people are supposed to say, this man is like no other, because he is like no other. He's the son of God. He's the son of man. And so they ask him, after doing these miracles, hey, so what sign are you going to do so we can see and believe in you? Like, is anyone else discouraged with the crowd or just me? Now, it reminds me to be patient with myself, to be patient with my family, to be patient with my friends. How often do we say things? Because we treat God as if we're consumers, every one of us. And we go to God and say, God, if you just do this, then I'll believe. Guys, that's a load of rubbish. That's about as good as my sourdough skills. But you won't. So often we say, well, God, if only you'll do this. And church, it's important as we pray for our yet to believe friends to remember why they do or why they don't believe. It's only by the grace of God. And we're going to see that over and over and over again. John chapter 6, verse 17, it shows us this, that these Jewish followers of Yahweh, that they're living in the dark. Remember chapter 6? He came to the disciples on the boat in the middle of the storm, and they were in the dark. Now, that was literal. I think it was nighttime, but it was also metaphorical. They didn't know. They didn't know the Son of God had not been revealed to them. And so they're literally saying, well, Jesus, what else are you going to do? How are you going to wow me now and guard your heart in your prayer life? Because so often that describes our prayer life, does it not? Well, God, this is what I need. God, this is what I want from you. God, if you do this, then I'll do that. And all God wants is for you to receive the bread of life and to be faithful. That's it. To see and to believe and to receive. So they say, what sign do you do that we might see and believe in you? What work do you perform? They go on and say, our fathers, they ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written in Exodus and Nehemiah and Psalms. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. But remember, they're in the dark. They're not connecting the dots here. Jesus is right in front of them, and yet they're so far from him. And so they're longing for a new Messiah. They're longing for a true and better Moses. That's what they're looking for. And Jesus might be it. And so that's why they've been following. They're hungry, literally and figuratively. And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, the most true thing you're going to hear about this is I say to you, it was actually not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it was my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and he gives life to the world. I think we have a, a potential and a tendency as the church to worship humans, or even places and spaces. Why? Because we can see them, we can touch them, we can feel them. Even the Jews would have been like, Father Abraham, Father Moses. And here's what Jesus says. Don't give Moses credit. You know Moses is a knucklehead, right? Like, go look at the leaders of the Israel people. Go look at the leaders of Vintage Grace. Go look at the leaders of the church. You know what they're full of? Sinners saved by grace and saints who still sin. Like, legit knuckleheads. And I'm like the CEO of the knuckleheads here, right? 
Like, let's be, amen, thank you, Zach, he's on our staff. <laughs> Don't miss this. Moses, he's not the hero. Who's the hero? The father that provides what we need. The father's the one that actually provided, not Moses. He says, the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Now, Jesus is the bread of God, Emmanuel. We just got done with Christmas. God is with us, and he comes to love the world. Now, at Vintage Grace, remember John 3, 16, for God so loves the what? Dumpster fire. Remember? With a dumpster fire, why? Because when John says the word world, it's not a positive term. At best, it's neutral. At best, it's neutral. It's not that the world is so big, oh my goodness, it's that the world is so bad. That God so loves the dumpster fire of 2020 and of 2021 and of El Dorado Hills and of California and America and the whole world. God so loves the world that he comes down from above to be the bread of life, to give us true sustenance so that we would never hunger or thirst again. And so when Jesus says these things, when John records these things, the drama is building, and I love verse 34, because the Jews are like, man, God so loves the world, I'm a part of the world. Now, don't miss this. When he says world, he's saying men and women. He's saying Jew and Gentile, the Samaritan woman at the well in chapter four. Every race and every gender, he's saying God loves the world, all-encompassing. And so these Jews are like, this is good news. God loves me. How often do we hear the word world, and we're such narcissists? Me, yes, you too. But he so loves the world. And so the Jews said to him, sir, give us this bread. Not about you, but as I'm reading the text this week, I'm like, this is good news. They're finally getting it. Maybe they're coming out of the dark, but they don't. In fact, seven times, Jesus is gonna say these I am statements. Every time, it's to give us clarity about who he is and about what his mission is, every time. And so today, it's I am the bread of life. In a couple weeks, it'll be I'm the light of the world. Then I am the door, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth, and the life, the true vine. The I am phrase is over 300 times in the Bible in a whole. And John's going to focus on these seven. And every time he's trying to help us see Jesus clearly so we can think rightly, so we can get off the throne of our heart and give it back to who designed it and created it and purchased it. And so Jesus says these I am statements. He makes it crystal clear in this next paragraph. This is who I am and this is what I'm about. This is my mission. He said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will not hunger Whoever believes in me will never thirst. He's trying to get them off of their physical needs and get them to their spiritual ones to embrace this metaphor of life. And he unpacks it now for the next few verses. He says, but I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. So my joy is diminishing as I'm studying this week. I'm like, they're gonna get it. And then you get to this verse and John gives us this foreshadowing. John says, they're there, but they're so far. That proximity isn't everything. That you could be in the room, just could be right in front of you and you could totally miss him. Like they see him, he's there, and yet they do not believe, they do not see him. All that the Father gives me, Jesus says, will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. How do we even come to God? Church, we were dead in our sin. We were dead in our sin, separated from the Father. We couldn't come to God. How do we come to God? Now our fifth value as a church is that we embrace inevitable tensions. So we have more joy in Jesus, number one, biblically saturated, transformed in community, culturally embedded as everyday missionaries, and then we embrace tensions. Why? Because every heresy in the church, the history of the church, is when we don't just let God be God. And when he tells us something, it's true. So do we choose God or does God choose us? The answer is yes. That's the answer. God loved us first, and yet we loved him. He stands at the door and knocks. That We only have the ability to open the door because he gave us the ability to see that we were dead in our sin. And so does God choose us? Do we choose him? I give this the same side of the coin of salvation and we embrace that tension as a church. That again, in God's divine power, he chooses us and yet in our human responsibility, we choose him. And that's what the text teaches. And in this context, Jesus is highlighting the divine part of that tension. He's not diminishing that we actually have to believe. He's just saying, don't miss. How do we believe? Because God chose us. That's what he said in chapter one, verses 12 through 13. And here's what he says. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. You are not a son or a daughter of the king because of how good of a baker you are, metaphorically. Your bread stinks. That's what he says. He says, your bread will rot, it will spoil. You're not gonna get there. But you know how you get there is by the father bringing you there. When the good shepherd picks up the lamb and he lays him over his shoulder and he brings him back to relationship, that's what Jesus is highlighting here. He says, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me. Now, I love the humility. You're gonna see this on display throughout the next few chapters in Jesus. He says, I don't do anything that the father doesn't tell me to do. Church, we would be wise to follow his example. 
Let's just focus on what matters most. He says, it's not my will, it's his will, and this is the will of him who sent me. I would lose nothing of all that he's given me, but I will raise it up on the last day. That phrase is gonna continue to come up. Last day, last day, last day. Why? Because Jesus cares about today, but he wants to make sure that you're ready for an eternity of tomorrows. He says, the last day matters, and if God gives you to me, this is the will of the Father, that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, at this point, as we're reading, we should be a little excited. You know why? Because the world's a dumpster fire, because the world's broken, because you and I can't bake to save our lives, literally and metaphorically, but God wins. Is that good news? That our salvation is not rooted in our skills, It's not in what we did, but it's in what he did. Somebody say amen. Amen. Like that changes everything because here's the bottom line. At Vintage Grace, we believe in eternal security. It's what the text teaches. If you could lose your salvation, guess what? You would. It's just that simple to me. We didn't earn it. We couldn't deserve it. We did not achieve or acquire. It was given to us, and that was the will of the Father, that we look to the Son, that we believe in him, that our eternal life is not based on our efforts, but on his. Like, that's the grace of God. That's what we mean when we say a vintage grace, more joy in Jesus, that he saved us. That was his perfect life transferred to ours. And then we get to verse 41. Like, I'm so excited at 30, all the way through 39, 40. And we get to verse 41. It says these awful words. So the Jews, what? Grumbled. Now, again, I want to be very careful in our judgment towards the Jews. Because when you read Jews, you might as well just read you. And don't misunderstand me. God's got a plan for Israel. He's not done with Israel. You're not, if you are Jewish, that's rad. I love my Jewish brothers. Gentiles, we're grateful for Jews. But just don't throw stones here. But it does say this, and I want to be clear. He says, so the Jews grumbled. We moved away from the crowd. Now we're saying the Jews, and they grumbled. Have you ever heard of the Jews grumbling before? When do the Jews grumble? All the time. When do you grumble? All the time. When they're in captivity, what do the Jews say? God, get me out of here. When they get out of captivity, what do the Jews say? God, let me go back there. Like, like, how exhausting is it to be in a relationship with the Jews? Right? Like, have you done the junior high romance before? It's a lose-lose. But God so loves the world, and even if the Jews grumble, and so as I'm reading that this week, I'm like, you know what this tells me? The Jews grumble in every circumstance. And you know what this tells me? That the circumstances are not the issue, rather the circumstances of my heart. Do the Jews grumble when they're the highest high and they're the lowest low? Why? Because we're never going to be satisfied until the bread of life fills our soul. Amen? And so when the Jews grumble, let's just be very careful because this was, I couldn't get past these words this week. I'm like, man, what knuckleheads. And then of course there's this idea where I'm like, he's talking about me, no matter what. And yet God is faithful and he's patient with his people. The Jews are grumbling about him because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say I've come down from heaven? They're in the dark. They don't get it. In fact, even their proximity has actually made it even more of a stumbling block. That they know Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. They know his origins, they know his history, but they don't know the power of the mystery of the divine word becoming flesh. And so he's in front of them, he's talking, he's leading, he's teaching, he's doing miraculous signs, but they totally miss what's standing right in front of them. And so the Jews grumbled, how can this be? How can he be the bread of life coming down from heaven? And I love what John does here. He goes, Jesus answered them, do not grumble amongst yourself. I love these verses. John doesn't tell us that they were grumbling amongst themselves at first, does he? He just says the Jews grumbled about him. Jesus knows that they're grumbling. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm at this weird spot in my life with my kids. They keep getting older every day, right? And they now know, especially my older boys, they know that I don't know everything. Like, that's a bummer as a dad. Like, there was a season of my life as a dad where they really thought, like, I was all powerful, I was all present, I was everywhere every time. There was one time my kids came and confessed something. I never would have known, but I'm like, they assumed I already knew right? Now they know that mom can still be in two places at once, but dad can't. And it's kind of a bummer place as a dad. I want you to think about this. The Jews are grumbling to themselves. Remember that that you don't do a miracle. Show me a sign. How are we supposed to believe in you? And so Jesus then answers them. Now I love this because we're smart enough. We would never grumble in front of Jesus, right? We don't talk bad about people in front of their face. We save that for Facebook, right? And so think about this. Jesus is like, no, 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 I'm God. I know your heart. 
And so, so he says, Jesus answered them, do not grumble amongst yourself. And all of a sudden people are like, are you talking out loud? How did he hear that? Because he's God. And so the Jews are grumbling and here's what Jesus says. I hear you. Don't worry. I'm not discouraged. I'm not depressed by your lack of faith. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. But when the father does that, I will raise him up. When the father does that on the last day, victory is had and death is defeated. Verse 45, as it is written in the prophets, Jesus says, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the father, it comes to me. That's how you come to me is because the father. Remember what Jesus did with Matthew? In Matthew chapter 16, 17, there's this beautiful passage where Peter actually responds about who Jesus is. He says, you're the son of God. You're the living son of God. And Jesus doesn't say, Peter, great job focusing in Drew's sermon last week. No, he says this. He says, blessed be the God and father because he's the reason why you know that. Because we're dead in our sin. We have nothing to save ourselves. If we could, we'd blow it. And yet the reality is this. He says, everyone who's heard has learned from the Father. He comes to me. That includes Peter. That includes you and me. He comes to me. And if anyone, not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He's talking about himself. He's seen the Father. And so truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has what? Eternal life. He's trying to get us off of the temporal, that which will expire, that which will mold and go away. And he wants to have foods that will never be hungry again. He says, I'm the bread of life. He's saying it again. Why? Because we're slow. Because we've missed it. He says, I'm the bread of life. Your fathers, they ate the man in the wilderness. Guess what happened to them after they ate? They died. What I'm offering you right now, the bread that comes down from heaven, is so that you might eat of it and never die. Guys, it doesn't matter if God gave you prime rib and filet mignon. If you eat a really good meal after so long, guess what you're going to do physically? You're going to die. I'm trying to give you something that will change forever. He goes on and says this, I'm the living bread, third time, that comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of this world is my flesh. Now, at this point, the Jews are like, oh, that's weird. Like, I was with you, Jesus, the, the bread of life, eternal life, like, I'm with you, but now you want me to eat you. Now, look at what it says. The Jews then disputed amongst themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Remember, they're in the dark. It's not that Jesus is saying, literally, he wants you to, to eat me. He's saying, he, he knows what the book of Leviticus says. He knows what Genesis and Deuteronomy 12 says. He knows that because he wrote it. He knows these things, but he's saying, metaphorically, you need my life for your life. You need a substitute. You need a sacrifice. You need a trade. That's what you need. You need to swap out your flesh for my flesh, your blood for my blood. That is what you need. And so again, the Jews are in the dark and they're disputing. They're grumbling and they're disputing. And Jesus says to them, truly, truly, I want you to get this. He's patient with the Jews. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks of my blood will have eternal life, and I will raise him up on that last day. Again, that phrase, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. He told the woman at the well, and the water I'm trying to give you is that you would be a true worshiper in spirit and in truth. I want to make that exchange. I want to make that trade. And again, they're in the dark. They don't get the metaphor. They totally miss it completely. And so Jesus closes here saying, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks on my blood abides in me. I can't wait for chapter 15. What does it look like for us to get off the throne of our heart? It means to surrender, to abide, to say, spirit, lead me in the same way that you led the son. Obey him, abide in him, and I in him as the living father sent me. And I live because of the father so whoever feeds on me, he'll also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread the fathers ate and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Now, one of the privileges I have as a pastor is to sit with people as they breathe their last breath. It's not often. It's a sacred space, but it's happened before. To, to get to go to a celebration of life at a graveside. And can I just be really honest? If I get to be a part of your funeral and you love and treasure Jesus and you've had the bread of life, it's a great day. It's what we mean by celebration of life. This week I wrote a message for a funeral of one of our vintage guys who love and trusted and treasured Jesus. That's a good day. Now again, don't hear me say we don't mourn for those of us who are kind of stuck here. Like we're still here. But those of us who are left behind that there's a mourning and a sadness, but on many levels, the primary part of the sadness is like, I want to be there. 
I don't want to get stuck in this world, but God's not done with it, so he's left us here for a reason and for a season. But don't miss this. Whoever feeds on the bread will live forever, for an eternity of tomorrow. And so as your pastor, if you've had the bread of your life, I can't wait to be at your funeral. I will not be sad for you. Your family, yes. You, I'll be a little jealous. That's part of what Jesus is saying here is, guys, what I'm offering you is the bread of life so you will never hunger or thirst again. And so there's so many implications for you and I this morning as we look at this text. And I want to just highlight a few. Now, again, there's so many ideas here. You're going to have to spend time in your life group this week. We did not cover all these verses. So you life group leaders, be blessed and have a long life group this week because you need the space. But the question, again, just like the miracle is, so what? So what are we going to do about it? Because the reality is Jesus feeds the 5,000 and the people reject and they miss the real point of the miracle is that they would never hunger or thirst again. So here's the first question. Church, are, are we satisfied? Now, this is not going to be an easy question to deal with or answer. We're going to start today, but, but I really want you to a- ask this question. You're going to be a little uncomfortable. And again, you being uncomfortable doesn't bother me in the slightest. Are you satisfied and what are you feeding your soul today? What are you spending your time, your talent, your treasure on? Calvin says that our hearts are idol factories. What are you putting a hope and a faith and a belief in to feed your soul? I want you to go think about what you write about in social media. Think about how you spend your money. Here's the question, are we satisfied and what is it that we're satisfied in? We set these money goals. Here's what I found, my friends that have money goals. Whenever they hit that goal, you know what they do next? They make a new one. Why? Because we're never satisfied. Workout goals. We set this goal and we hit it and then it's like, well, I got to do the next one. You run a marathon and you're like, I could do better next time. I can't. I'm done. <laughs> but what are the things in our life that we're pursuing with our time and our talent and our treasure? Sex, never enough. Love, never enough. Like, like why do affairs happen because we're not satisfied? Because in a foundational and fundamental thing, we believe that that will make me happier than this does, and so we give up on it. And I think it's, it's the fruit of being in a fallen, broken world and believing the lies of advertisements of Satan and of the world itself. It's things like Snickers. You guys know the Snickers slogan, right? Hungry, why wait? Why wait? Because it's not good for you. It's sugar and it's poison. That's why you wait. But church, what are the things that we're putting our hope in? When Jason led us in the time of confession, this is that moment when we say as a church that there's more joy in Jesus, what makes you happy? These are indicators of our heart. That's what Jesus cares about. He doesn't want to talk about, are you hungry physically? You're at the 1130 service. The answer is yes. But spiritually speaking, Are you hungry? Church, this is imperative because I think the most important evangelistic tool that we have as the church today in the 21st century is our joy in Jesus. And joy, I think sometimes we think of joy as like it's the chest bump during the service. It's the high, it's the high five, it's the woo. But joy is that. But sometimes it's like, I'm just really satisfied in Jesus. What's your marriage like? It's a total train wreck. We got these two sinners that are trying to live together and raise kids, and now they know that we don't know everything. It's terrible. But God is good. Are you satisfied? And can I just be really, really honest? Because I think it's easy for us to be like, of course I'm satisfied. No, no, no. The answer for all of us is not enough. Every one of us. We're all tempted to settle for less. We're all tempted to believe the lies of Satan that if I just had this, if I just had that, and we start worshiping the creation instead of the creator, and that's a core heart issue of us being satisfied in Jesus, of us being desperate and dependent, broken men and women who are trying to satisfy our spiritual hunger. Franz Kafka is a a Jewish author. He's an atheist. And he wrote about this reality that everyone has a spiritual hunger. In fact, as an author, at the end of his life, he says, I really would like you to burn all of my books except for this one book. And it was a short story called, I just lost my notes, The Hunger Artist. He summed up his thoughts. He wanted other people to know about the spiritual hole in their heart because this was a man as an author that, again, he tried sex. He tried women. He tried success. He tried writing good books. He was well-known. He was famous, and yet nothing satisfied. In fact, the short story that he wrote that he said, please keep this. Get rid of all my other work, but please keep 
the hunger artist was this story about a man that went on fasting for this extended period of time. At the end of the time, he was going to have this kind of press conference and they were all going to come together and they were going to have this man come out as the hero and he was going to wobble up to the stage and then share his learnings about fasting. And at the very end, he said, you guys all think I'm fasting. I'm not fasting. I just have never found anything in this world that satisfies. That was the author's short story. That was his life. Church, we're hungry. And so I think the most important relationship in your life is between you and God and Jesus satisfies. So when we say as a church that there's more joy in Jesus than anything or anyone else, my question is, are you satisfied? And can we just be transparent? We're gonna go to communion. Communion's a time to repent. It's time to get off the throne of our heart and say, God, I wasn't satisfied this week. I put that on my throne. I trusted in that for joy that you never offered. I believed that that was gonna make me happy. He's the bread of life so that you would never hunger or thirst again. Are we satisfied? And we can't play the Christian game that says, yeah, we got it. No, no, we're here on Sundays because we're in process. Because we're sinners saved by grace and saints who still sin and we're led by knuckleheads and we are knuckleheads and we need the bread of life. That's our one, this deep relationship with God. Now our two, this is why I love Sunday mornings. I love Sundays. I love life groups on Tuesday nights. I love getting in smaller groups. We don't have to come and be like, man, this was such a good week. I nailed it. I did everything awesome. We already know you didn't do that. So we can just be real. Desperate, dependent, sinners saved by grace, saints who sin, beggars that have found food. I love the way John Piper says, he says this way, God is most glorified when you're most satisfied in him. So let's repent of where we're not satisfied and let's look at our life and say, God, I want to find all of my joy and my contentment in you and in you alone. I grew up in a religious reality that I always thought I had to read the Bible better. I had to pray more. I had to give more. That would make God happy. You know what makes God happy? Is when you just surrender. When in humility you say, I'm going to get off the throne of my heart and I'm just going to receive the bread of life. That's what makes God happy. That God wants you to be happy and he's going to get the most glory when you find your happiness in him and in him alone. And so this morning, we're going to be beggars that found food. We're going to come together and we're going to go to the cross and we're going to believe and we're going to receive. And we're going to take communion a little bit differently. I want to invite you right now, if you're watching on home, to grab your elements. If you're here, to grab them. We're not going to take them right now. We're going to sing a song. I want you to have an extended time to repent. I want you to have an extended time to think about those questions. Are we satisfied? Are we ready? I think IHOP got it right. IHOP says, come hungry, leave happy. My hope is we came this morning hungry, needing grace, needing mercy, because Jesus is the eternal grace, the eternal mercy that he's extended to you. And so instead of rushing to take the elements, I want to just hold them. I want to sing this words of these songs that says, let's come to the altar, not because we deserve it, not because we've earned it, but as we come and as we repent, the Father receives us in our hunger, And in our brokenness, he's satisfied. So Spirit of God, would you continue to speak to us as we repent? As we hold these elements, would we remember that you came to satisfy our spiritual hunger? And as we come to you, that we can gladly receive your grace. Father, receive us with these arms open wide, we pray. Church, let's sing.